Income tax 2022-2023. Penalty on early withdrawal of savings and alimony paid. Let's do some wealth preservation with some tax preparation. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. Most of this information comes from the Form 1040 Instructions Tax Year 2022, Instructions for Schedule 1, Additional Income and Adjustments to Income, Adjustments to Income section, which you can find at the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Looking at the income tax formula, we're focused on line two, that being the adjustment to income. Remembering that the income tax formula, the first half of it at least, is in essence a modified income statement, although a strange one where we have income minus the equivalent of the expenses being the deductions. Careful deductive reasoning. Gets to the equivalent of net income, that being taxable income. Our objective flipped on its head. Instead of us trying to maximize the net income, we're trying to minimize, have as low as possible, the taxable income. Now, when we think about the adjustments to income, this is in essence a deduction, but you can also think of it as a contra income account, for example, because we have income minus the adjustments to income gets to the adjusted gross income or AGI. The AGI is an important number because when we look at phase outs for deduction phase outs due to income level, credit phase outs due to income level, they're generally based on the adjusted gross income AGI as opposed to the top line, the income line. Also note that the adjustments to income do not have the same kind of threshold that they have to clear as do the itemized deductions having to clear the standard deduction before we get a benefit from the adjustments to income. So if we qualify for them, we typically get, typically get a benefit from them. Also note the adjustments to income might be called above the line deductions or schedule one deductions. So if we look at the first page of the form 1040, we're focused down here on line 10, adjustments to income schedule one line 26. If we look at the schedule one page uh, two, we're focused here on the penalties on early withdrawal of savings and uh, the alimony paid. So if we're thinking about the penalties for early withdrawal, these might be penalties that are applied to you from the financial institution, depending on the type of, of items that you're putting your money into. Sometimes you're kind of locking your money into the financial institution and, pro and telling them, I'm not going to take the money out take the money just for a certain time period. That usually results in a higher interest rate that you'll be able to earn on your investment. And that's due to because uh, the bank is able to take that money and say, well, if you promise that you're not going to pull it out, then they can invest it uh, somewhere and, and they have, you know, it affects their reserves, how much reserves they basically have to hold on to. And so they can make more money with it if they're confident that you're going to you're going to leave it in there for a longer period of time, which results in higher interest payments. So if you take the money out early, then you might be subject to penalties. So then we have the alimony. So we talked before on the income side of the alimony situation, if you have a divorce type of situation, then you could have money going from one spouse to another spouse. And the question is, is the one that's paying the money able to get a deduction for that payment? And is the one that's receiving the money required to include it in income? So it's just like a normal kind of financial transaction from the IRS perspective. Uh, they have the leverage on the one that's paying because if you're paying the money, then you then if you were able to get a deduction, that would be good for the one that's receiving the money. They, they would like to receive the money, of course, but not have to include it in income. So it wouldn't be a taxable income type of scenario. So you'll recall that when we looked at the income side, that there was a cutoff date where before that date, there was a big emphasis on the distinction between the payments. And you might say, why does it matter what you call it? 
and money's going from one person to the other, but it was important what you called it for taxes being either alimony or child support, because if it was alimony, then it's something that the payer could deduct and the recipient would have to include an income. And in that case, just like a normal financial transaction, the IRS would say, hey, you have to tell us who you gave the money to, because if we can't get our taxes from you, we want to get it from the recipient, the person who received the money. So you got to put the social security number in there. However, if it was child support, then the person paying the money doesn't get the deduction. The person receiving the money doesn't have to record it in income. The IRS is basically not getting involved uh, in the situation for that. And then there was a big kind of problem in terms of, well, how do we categorize something as child support uh, versus alimony, which wasn't always uh, clear in the, in the divorce agreement and so on. But after the cutoff date, they basically are saying that the IRS is just going to stay out of these payments altogether. So whether it be alimony or child support, the person paying doesn't get a deduction. The person receiving doesn't have to include it in income. Now, when this happened, a lot of people thought that that was kind of unfair to the person paying the money because they're the ones that would benefit if they get a deduction. However, uh, you would think that if the, the actual contract happened or the divorce happened after the cutoff date, that it would be a more simple kind of scenario and the agreement would then reflect the fact that the person paying doesn't get the tax benefit that they would have before, right? And if you had the contract before, when there was a benefit to the person paying, if it was categorized as alimony, it would result in a different agreement in an ideal world if everything was, uh, everybody knew everything about the situation and was being honest about everything, you would think the agreement would just change in accordance to what the taxes are. So I would think it being more simple would be easier for a divorce type of situation. So I, I think it would be, and, and the way they put it in there kind of makes sense, of course, because if you came to the agreement before the cutoff date and you, and you have these tax consequences as you made the agreement, then uh, you would, that would alter the agreement you would expect. And so you don't want to change the tax law retroactively, but then going forward, you would think that it would make more sense for the IRS to just stay out of the whole thing altogether and not have this complication between alimony and child support. And the new agreements would then reflect the current tax situation. So the agreements would look different, you would you would expect. But that's just my thought on it. I don't What do I know? <laughs> I, but line 18, I would stay out of it if I was the IRS, you know, get your money. It's got to be an easier way to get your money than from the divorce, uh, uh, two people in the divorce. Or so. Any case, line 18, penalty on early withdrawal of savings. So when you have the form 1099 interest or form 1099 OID, you, re uh, you received will show the amount of any penalty you were charged. So if you have interest income or dividend income, your financial institution will typically be required to issue you a 1099 INT or OID, which we talked about in prior presentations on the income side of things. And if you were subject to penalties, then they have to give you that penalty item, which may result in being able to deduct up here on line 18. So it's a pretty straightforward, easy deductible item or easy identifiable item to put into the data inputs. You don't see it too often because hopefully you and your clients aren't uh, being subject to penalties or having to pull money out early where they would be subject to penalties. But there it is. If you see it, it should be pretty straightforward. Lines 19A, 19B, and 19C, alimony paid, line 19A. So if you made payments to or for your spouse or former spouse under a divorce or separation agreement entered into on or before December 31st, 2018, there's the cutoff date, you may be able to take this deduction. So you can't take a deduction for alimony payments you made to or for spouse if you entered into your divorce or separation agreement after December 31st, 2018, or if you entered into the agreement on or before December 31st, 2018, and the agreement was, was changed after December 31st, 2018 to expressly provide that alimony received is not included in your former spouse's income, use tax topic 452 or C publication uh, 504. So obviously divorce agreements that happened before this time then, then had to deal with that issue of should it be alimony or child support, which had a bigger uh, tax implication. And I would think that would lead to more 
confusion, you know, so you'd like things to be as kind of clear as possible so you can come up to, to the agreement. And then after that date, then the divorce agreements don't have that thing that's kind of clouding clouding the the scenario in terms of well what will the tax implications be and whatnot so uh, i would think that would lead to uh more f people feeling like they're they understand the agreement better going forward but line 19c on line 19c enter the month and year of your original divorce or separation agreement that relates to this deduction for alimony so you got to put it in there so that they have the information on the irs side so they're confident that this whole alimony thing is from an agreement before the cutoff date.